Did you know that the turn indicators are actually inspired by the human heartbeat? What's up guys? This is my Mazda CX-50 long-term review, uh, one of many to come. I've had this car now for a few months. I bought it right after Thanksgiving. I've put on about 2,000 miles since then and I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of things I like about this car, a few things I don't like, which we're gonna to get to shortly. But overall, you gotta admit, this thing is one hell of a looker, by small CUV standards, of course. All right, so going back to the indicators, this is one of the very few times that my MD actually comes uh, in use when reviewing cars, so, so bear with me. This is actually inspired by the human heartbeat. They took a look at the ECG. This is from Atsuya Yoshida, a designer and lamp development leader. And he says that using an electrocardiogram or ECG or EKG, I watched heartbeat waveforms undulate, linger, and diminish, resulting in a turn signal that expresses the warmth lacking in LED headlamps. Now I have a slight problem with that because if you look at an ECG, you have the QRS complex followed by a T wave. There's nothing that actually is sharp and then a slow taper off. That's not quite right. What he's probably looking at is an arterial waveform instead where you have the contraction systole of the heart, which is more immediate, which is the fast blink on, and then the slow fade off, which is more of the, uh, the elasticity of the vessels, allowing that blood to propagate. So you can find that with an arterial line or with a Doppler ultrasound. But small little thing I just wanted to comment on. Now, I do have a confession to make, guys. In that first video I made about my CX-50, I commented that the steering feel was relatively numb. And that wasn't honest. Essentially, when I first got this car, I thought the steering was amazing. But I felt very stupid. I'm a newer car reviewer, and I'm like, you know what? I can't look like a total idiot. I can't say that this car has amazing steering. I actually talked to one of my friends who's also a car reviewer, and I said, hey man, I know this sounds weird, but you know, I think there's steering feel, but maybe not. Like, let me, let me keep paying attention. And I convinced myself that it wasn't there because I thought I was being biased, that by buying this vehicle, I wanted to see the good in it, and therefore I was overestimating its steering. But the steering is phenomenal in this car. It is a, essentially a sports car steering rack, but it has some issues with the throttle and brakes, which we'll get to shortly. But first, before we do that, let me actually tell you a little bit more about this interior because whenever I have friends, guests, etc., sit in this car, they always comment on, holy crap, this is a Mazda? Like the quality of the leather, even this terracotta interior, this color is much more premium than, it looks much more premium than the standard black, which is why I was so set on getting this. But everyone is universally surprised by the build quality because this is just a Mazda. It's supposed to be, you know, cheap. It's supposed to be Toyota, Honda level, but it is definitely much more premium. Mazda doing a great job. Um, in the rear here, I have these mats to protect this since I put my bike. I actually fold these seats down very easily, just like that. And my 58 centimeter road bike without taking anything off, fits in the back, but I still actually purchased the Kurt trailer hitch, I installed it myself. There's just a little bit of uh, cutting away that I used a Dremel for, but other than that, it didn't take too long, maybe an hour or less. And my bike will just fit right here. You can see the tire marks because I keep putting it in that way. Um, by the way, Dyson fans tend to be problematic in my experience, would not recommend those. Comfort of the seats, I think is totally fine. No one that has ever ridden in mine complained about the seat comfort. Although some people online say that they're too hard. I have not found that to be the case personally. I wish there was the uh, like a foot sensor so that if I was carrying things, this would open. But this is the top of the line Turbo Premium Plus and you do not get that. But it is a motorized tailgate, which is nice. to the passenger side as well. Again, a very nice, comfortable place to be. Really high build quality. Really, really impressive. So 
So with that out of the way, let me tell you about the driving dynamics. I've been really surprised that I drive this car way, way more than I anticipated. I thought I would only use this when going to Costco or hauling a Dyson fan to the repair center or various things like that. And yet I find myself defaulting to this. This is such a comfortable and pleasant car to drive. Even though it's a CUV, I find that this uh, 360 view cam is insanely helpful. Um, I didn't realize how useful a 360 cam would be when parking in tight spaces and, and navigating parking lots and such. Um, one complaint I do have is that you can press this button here, the parking sensor off. And you can see there, parking sensor off. And I do that when I have the bike hitch on the back of the, of the vehicle. But even though the parking sensor is says that it's off, it'll still trigger and do the emergency braking and stop all of a sudden. So I'm not sure what's going on there. It's like the parking sensor off only does a partial disable. It doesn't fully disable it. Um, if one of you owners have any insight, please do let me know. The other strange thing is that the vent, I found this from a user on Reddit. Um, the vent here, when you have it on feet only, you'll still get a bit of warm air here, which is not ideal because when you're driving, you don't want warm air blowing on your face. It is subtle, but it is there. So I turned that vent off and I believe this one as well. Not the end of the world, uh, just a small, slight annoyance that you need to turn this off manually even though you have feet selected only. The other cool thing about the climate control is with auto, it can actually control the heated seats and steering wheel for both driver and passenger. However, it's inconsistent. So right now, if I turn it up to high, it's decided that the heated seat and steering wheel does not need to be enabled but sometimes it does. Maybe based on the ambient temperature, it's 54 degrees outside. I don't know, I can't figure it out. because so usually I'm just manually enabling these. Having the physical touch controls is really nice, really welcome. The piano black doesn't look that nasty. I thought it would look worse after two months, but I do get this cleaned every month or so and it's, it's all right. I don't love this area, but it'll do. Another big complaint that comes up is the infotainment. Now, I actually think the infotainment is brilliant. You can enable touch on CarPlay or Android Auto at all times, whether driving or stationary. However, when you go to the uh, the Mazda infotainment, this is only touch when you're stationary. Otherwise, you have to use this. Now, this rotary dial is very intuitive, very easy to use, and I actually prefer the display being in this position, even though it's too far. Two reasons. So number one, in my GR86 as an example, it's down here, very easy to touch, but you need to move your eyes from up there to down here. It's quite a bit of movement and it's not ideal from a safety perspective, whereas this one is more in your line of sight. You don't need to move down that much. The other thing is actually your eyes accommodating. Now, your ciliary muscles in your eyes help with accommodation for close, uh, when, when trying to focus on things close to you. So the closer something is, the harder your ciliary muscles need to work, and that's why you get eye strain when you bring something really close. If you read your, your, your phone or your book too close up, it's causing eye strain. That's why you want it a little bit further. Having the display a little bit further out like that is actually more pleasant than in my GRs, even though it's a slight difference, like from here to there. It is more pleasant going viewing outside to then viewing the infotainment back and forth because again, line of sight and less accommodation required by my ciliary muscles. If I do need to touch it really, then I, I do need to lean forward a little bit, which is somewhat of an annoyance, but I generally don't need to. I am very used to this. You have some, some shortcuts to navigation, to music, to whatever. And um, I'm actually very pleased with the infotainment system. Now, as for the driving, it's mostly a good experience. The steering is surprisingly heavy for this kind of vehicle. You would, exp you would expect a steering rack to be this heavy in a sports car, and yet we're in a CUV. That's something that I've gotten used to. I don't think it's a big deal at all. But others don't quite feel the same. The steering is really impressive though with regards to feedback and accuracy. 
This is what I want in a sports car steering rack. Most sports cars don't have steering racks that are this good. I am not exaggerating. This is a fantastic steering rack. The, the feel, the feedback, the accuracy, the weighting, the way it loads up when you're taking a corner fast, is it's shocking. You're like, what the hell? How did Mazda put a sports car steering rack in a small CUV? Now, the issue is that it doesn't match the input of the throttle and the brake. So you want a cohesive input experience when you're driving. If the steering is really sporty, as this is, but then the throttle and brake are kind of lazy and slow, it feels a bit fragmented. It feels a bit off. I've gotten used to it, but you know, if I go drive another car and then come back to this, I, I notice it immediately. I notice that the throttle requires a bit more a bit more uh, travel to get the acceleration that you would expect to be consistent with the steering. Same with the brakes. The brakes are lacking in feedback. They do require a lot of travel. They're kind of soft and squishy. So a small nitpick, I think most people who aren't driving aficionados will give zero fucks about that, but it's worth mentioning. Having the paddle shifters is a very nice touch versus having to do this. Although I do appreciate they have the shift directions in the right direction, meaning uh, going down, downshifting is forward. As when you're braking, you're, uh, the G-forces are pushing you forward. You want to push that way. And then when you're accelerating to go up a gear, you go this way. Perfect. Perfect on that front, but I'm generally in automatic regardless. Did you guys notice that start stop right there? You can disable it each time you drive by pressing I stop off. However, it will not remember your settings. I wish that it would because I prefer not having I stop on, but I guess it's something that I just have to get used to or every time I start up the car, I'll need to press this. The wireless charger, I was very excited about getting a wireless phone charger with the Turbo Premium Plus model. It's essentially useless. It never really works. Um, even when I take the case off of my iPhone, it'll say wireless charging unavailable. It'll charge for about 30 seconds and you can see it in that first video as well. And then it'll stop. Very frustrating and I've tried, um, you know, I've tried placing it center, you know, perfectly center and not even driving, just sitting in a parking lot, same issue. So from my experience with an iPhone 14 Pro, it's essentially useless. There it is again, even though I'm plugged in now and I always plug in because of that reason. I would suggest getting these 90 degree cables though, because otherwise when you put it into the slot, a traditional cable will jut that way and it's harder to position it in that nook. So get these 90 degrees and it'll also, uh, it's also 90 degrees at the USB-A end, which makes it easier when plugging it up inside this, uh, this center console. Some other small things, the automatic windshield wipers don't work that well from my experience. I have it on the auto setting and you can adjust the sensitivity here. And I find that between the highest setting, sometimes it's, it goes too frequently and then the second highest setting is too slow. So there's too much of a gap there. It doesn't rain that often here in Vegas, but it's rained a few times these last few weeks where I have tested it and I can't quite get this uh, to behave in the way that I want it to. The other thing that's kind of annoying is that if I press the trunk open button here, but the all the doors are not unlocked, then it will not actually open the trunk. So as I press it, nothing's happening. I know, I know that if I unlock it and then press this, it'll open like that. But I wish that it would just, I mean, if I'm in the car, the car's running, you know, is that really necessary? Let's close that. Overall impressions after close to 2,000 miles, I'm pretty happy. I got the car for $42,000, that's MSRP for the Turbo, Turbo Premium Plus, which is the highest trim, and I am very happy with my purchase. I think that it drives significantly better than other CUVs. It's not quite Porsche Macan by any means, but it is a joy to drive. The steering field, I mean, the suspension is stiffer than the competition, but that results in better handling, better body control when you are pushing it around the corners. The way the steering loads up, I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful car to drive. I do enjoy being behind the wheel and the comfort is on point too. The interior quality, the amenities, 
it punches well above its weight class. The styling as well, I was driving my GR86 the other day on the highway, saw one of these, and I was like, damn, the muscular shoulders, how low and wide it looks, it's really great. And compared to the CX-5, the CX-5 is a little bit taller and narrower. And if you think about the utility when you're placing things, generally you want a wider floor because you can fit more things. How often are you stacking things all the way high up where you're limited in a CUV by height? Sometimes you are, but usually it's more the width that you're limited by. So I appreciate the, the greater length and width of the CX-50 over the CX-5, as well as the styling. Interior on this feels a little bit nicer than the CX-5 as well. And even small details like the indicator, just that sound, it's like that, it sounds like a snap, like a high quality, very pre, like the smallest details, the attention to detail that Mazda has with the indicator, you know, having that slow fade to mimic the heartbeat or even the sound of the indicator. I really, really enjoyed that. And the last thing guys, I apologize that I wasn't totally honest with my initial impressions of this car with regards to the steering saying that, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's numb, whatever. I kind of psyched myself out. I thought one thing, I thought that I was being biased and I tried to convince myself that it wasn't actually there, but the steering of this is fantastic. And moving forward, I'm just gonna call it like I see it. Even if I sound like an idiot, I'll tell you that, hey, this CUV has really good steering feedback. Part of what actually helped me come to that conclusion and not believe that I'm just crazy and, 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 and not just speaking out of my butt is when both Savage Geese and Throttle House and Jason Camisa all commented that the CX-50 has an insanely good sports car-esque steering rack. So that's it, my friends. If you have any questions about the CX-50, then let me know with a comment down below. Much love. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in that next one.